Today's presentation will be given by Dr. Thomas Kelly. He received his PhD from the University of Chicago in 2017. This yeah. year. A couple of months ago. <laughs> and is a first year fellow in the Michigan Society of Fellows and an assistant professor in the Department of Asian Languages and Culture. His current research explores the re relationship between Chinese literature and the decorative arts in the early modern world. Today he will be speaking on the literary inscription of things in early modern China. Please join me in welcoming him. Thank you, Mary. <coughs> and thank you, everyone, for coming. And thank you, Anna, for, your, for all the organizational help and assistance. Um, so today, I'm just going to present my current, sort of the beginnings of my current uh, book project. Um, so I'd be very grateful to hear your advice and your suggestions and your comments in the question and answer session. So in addition to writing with the brush and ink, Chinese poets throughout the late imperial period engraved verse onto cups and chairs, walking sticks and mirrors, pots, daggers, rocks, and musical instruments. They even etched and molded their words onto the implements with which they ordinarily wrote on paper. So ink stones, brushes, and ink cakes. In this talk today, I'm gonna ask the question, why? Uh, what were the motivations behind such practices? And how did they alter or even redefine the possibilities for written expression? So the early modern period in China, much as in Western Europe, is usually associated with the ascendancy of the printed book um, as a dominant technology of textual transmission. And yet throughout the Ming and the Qing dynasties, which is sort of the 15th to the 18th century is the period I'm talking about today, um, we see the stubborn persistence of other graphic media and unlikely textual formats. So as a scholar of Chinese literature, I'm especially interested in how this art of writing on things shaped understandings of verse. So how, for instance, does reading an inscription on an ink stone um, change the way we think about the voice or the persona or ultimately the message of a human poet? Yet I hope to suggest that there is also some sort of contemporary resonance to this topic. As we live at a historical moment where the printed book is no longer necessarily the dominant way in which we experience writing or even or, or literature. So looking at inscribed objects from early modern China, we can pose sort of two sets of questions. First, how might acts of inscription define or even transform human relations to the material world? And second, what other forms of writing and reading might be possible beyond the pages of the book? So to address these questions, I will focus in this talk on a set of case studies from the 16th century, introducing some of the profound transformations in the relations between words and things in, the early, modern, in early modern China. But my aim is not really to offer a single interpretive method or a simple argument for a specific case, but rather to describe this broader moment of change in practices of writing and suggesting some of the ways in which these early modern inscriptions both challenge and also resonate with our own attachments to the labels on objects. So what is an inscription? In Imperial China, when a scholar chose to engrave their words onto an artifact, they turned to an ancient genre named the inscription, or Ming, that developed in the late Warring States period. In Chinese, the word Ming can be understood as both a verb to engrave and also as a noun for an engraved text or, and later for a specific literary genre. There was, of course, a long and complex history of engraving sacrificial prayers, divinations, and political memorials onto bone, metal, and stone substrates. But it was during the late Warring States period that we see the emergence of a stylized literary form named Ming, which is a branch of what is now known as the many masters and hundred expert genre of political philosophical writing. So these terse epigrammatic texts, and some of them are only like nine characters long, uh, usually foregrounded the function of a man-made artifact, a tool or an instrument, um, to impart a warning or a, a memorable aphorism. So one recent scholar has compared them to motivational posters or bumper stickers, short one-liners that offer readers an easily digestible moral platitude. While some of these short texts claim descent from ancient practices 
of engraving ritual media. Um, they actually bear very little in common with what we now know of inscribed sacrificial bronze vessels or stone stele, for instance. So before turning to the early modern period, which is the focus of my own research, I will briefly introduce some of the earliest prototypes for this genre, um, examining the rhetorical conventions and thematic concerns of the Ming inscription. So late imperial genre theorists claimed that the archetypal model for the literary inscription could be found in a set of short aphorisms that King Wu, the founder of the Zhou dynasty, allegedly etched onto his household implements. So in each case, the function of the object encodes a moral lesson. So for instance, we are warned that without a reliable walking stick or a staff, we might lose the path or the way. Or the mirror reminds us to look at what is in front and think about what is behind, or in, in other words, to sort of critically examine ourselves. And the bow uh, cautions against overstretching or being too flexible um, or too rigid. So in each of these examples, the sage cultivates himself through becoming an almost mechanical extension of his tools. Um, scholars have recently, however, questioned how we should read these admonitions. Are they to be taken as serious moral statements, or is there a degree of irony behind these sometimes banal assertions? So these are sort of very trite platitudes. What are we to make of the paradox of a king who needs to rely on these humble implements for self-instruction? So we are left with the puzzle of a sage who gives his words to a thing so the thing can re-instruct him how to be a sage. The King Wu admonitions survive on bamboo slips from the late Warring States period. And we also have surviving inscribed objects with short admonitory texts from this time, artifacts that bear clear similarities with the King Wu admonitions. So one of the most widely discussed examples is a spoon or a fish cauldron ladle now held in the Liaoning Museum. Like King Wu's admonitions, this inscription instructs its reader to copy the example of the spoon as it enters into and out of a boiling fish soup. Uh, the inscription plays with the tale of the yellow emperor's mythical slaughter of a rebel named Chuyo. The way the emperor peeled off his skin, stuffed his stomach to make a ball, fermented his bones and flesh, and threw him into a bitter broth for people to drink. Um, so the point is, with this inscription is to create a cautionary tale warning the reader who should imitate the spoon against becoming boiling, boiled alive as a fishball like this evil rebel. So we, we should copy the spoon. Um, the gathering of graphs on the cup-shaped bowl of the ladle perhaps suggests that the admonition not only commands the reader to carefully place the spoon in the cauldron, but also cautions them against hastily transferring the boiling soup from the pot to their mouths. So again here, the medium is the message. We can already see in these examples some of the thematic conventions of later inscriptions. Pre-modern genre theorists claimed that the inscription was defined by two principles. The first was admonition or warning, and the second is eulogy or praise. These two modes of address operate in different registers and proceed in slightly different directions. So with an admonition, we're moving from the function of the object to the behavior of the human, and with praise, there's this move from projecting human values onto the object. So the interplay between these two tendencies ends up creating a curious mode of ventriloquism with humans speaking through things and things talking back through humans. A challenge for later authors was how to combine admonition and eulogy without one principle eclipsing the other. So how to praise an object while using that same object to make a point. At the same time, even in these examples, we can begin to see the emergence of what became a lasting tension between ethical instruction and irony or wit. So authors of inscriptions had to juggle between an imperative to offer a moral lesson and literary tactics of punning and illusion. In this respect, the history of the inscription, a genre that has often been treated as marginal to the development of Chinese literature, raises broader questions about the role and function of literary writing in general. So while there is, of course, far much more to say about the roots and development of the inscription, we can now move from the early period to the late imperial era, the Ming and the Qing dynasties, which is the focus of my current research. And we can think about how this classical literary form was updated or redefined in an early modern context. <laughs> 
So the 16th century was an era of profound upheaval and instability in Chinese material culture. The spread of South American silver and the rapid expansion of trans-regional commodity markets led to a proliferation of exotic imports and commercial goods, which in turn triggered new anxieties around issues of authenticity and counterfeiting. So in the rest of the talk, I'm going to ask, how was this ancient form of the inscription adapted to respond to or intervene in early modern material culture? So to examine the transformations of the inscription in this period, I will use the remainder of the talk to introduce three case studies. First, an inscription for a rhinoceros horn cup. Second, an inscription for a stringed lute or a pipa. And third, an inscription for a commercial ink cake. These three short texts allow us to explore sort of larger, larger themes. So it's not just these sort of specific objects, but I'm trying to get at these bigger questions from the period. Um, so first is the relation between the exotic and the antique, or between the new and the old. The second is this relationship between self and other. And finally, we can look at the rise in this period of sophisticated forms of commercial branding. So with these three examples, which I hope to show sort of feed into each other, we not only see how the inscription was adapted for new purposes, but we also get a sense of the changing relations between humans and things at this moment. All three of these cases, so all three of these inscriptions, come from the collection of an eminent Ming Dynasty scholar named Wang Daokun, a man who embodies in many ways the changing socioeconomic conditions of Ming China. So Wang, who is pictured here as a stone statue, uh, was the son of a family of wealthy salt merchants. But he was also an acclaimed poet, a playwright, an essayist, and he served as a vice minister of war. So he's famous for fighting uh, Japanese pirates in the 1560s. So he led a very sort of rich and diverse life. By focusing on this single collector, I want to suggest some of the different ways in which a writer might try to lay claim to possessions through acts of inscription. We tend to think of authors in terms of what they wrote on paper or what they published on paper. But here, with this case, we can reflect on how practices of writing on the surfaces of objects offer a different picture of what it meant to be a writer. So my first case is for a rhinoceros horn cup. There are sporadic references to luxury artifacts wrought from this material in collections from the Tang and the Song dynasties. Yet it was only in the 16th century, following the expansion of maritime trade routes from Fujian to Southeast Asia and to India, that we start to find reliable records of Chinese craftsmen working with this material. Virtually all of the extant rhinoceros horn wine cups and bowls in museum collections are dated at the very earliest to the mid 16th century. And it was during this period that the cup, rather than uh, a box or a scepter, became the dominant class of object rendered in this material. One of the earliest transmitted inscriptions on a rhinoceros horn cup also survives from the 16th century, and it was attributed to the writer we're looking at, Wang Daokun. This is a text for a vessel that was manipulated to imitate a mallow flower or a common hibiscus. So the inscription reads, I have a suhorn beaker for your splendid banquet. My heart will always be faithful. You are like the radiant sun. So Wang's inscription encodes, effectively encodes a short toast. The handler is invited to inhabit the eye of the inscription and through lending their voice to the words on the vessel to wish a guest long life as they pass the cup at a banquet. The last line, you are like the radiant sun, alludes to the cliché of a loyal minister being like a mallow flower that tilts towards the emperor or the sun. And so it playfully refers to the flowery design of the cup. On a surviving, on a surviving rhinoceros horn cup with this inscription, which is now held in a private collection, we can see that the characters are incised onto the lips of the vessel and therefore evoke the symbolic relationship between the recitation of the inscription and ingestion, so between reading and drinking. It was widely assumed that the material of rhinoceros horn could expel poison. And so Wang's auspicious blessings here call forth a sense of the nourishment afforded through oral contact with the surface of the cup. 
In what follows, I will try and unpack the significance of this inscription, this inscription, first by thinking about the floral appearance of the cup, and then by thinking about this classical reference to an arcane object named the Sirhorn beaker in the first line. So this text is composed almost entirely from illusions, and like the other inscriptions I'll examine today, it might seem sort of pretty short and almost insignificant in terms of meaning. So if you're a scholar of Chinese literature and you read these kinds of texts, they initially seem almost sort of trivial and superfluous, and there's not much, there's not really much to get sort of to get into in terms of meaning. But I want to suggest how actually the sort of short, seemingly kind of um, pointless text actually offers clues to a history of thinking about the ancient and the exotic in the Ming dynasty. So as we have seen, this is not just a rhinoceros horn cup, but a horn that has been manipulated to look like a flower. Particularly, it has what we call a reticulated ring base, which almost disguises the natural shape of the horn. Ming Dynasty rhinoceros horn cups adorned with these floral motifs can be traced to Haicheng in the prefecture of Zhangzhou in Fujian. Located on a river estuary, this port was a major international trading center with the Spanish Philippines and was one of the main sort of centers through which foreign goods and exotica like Sumatran, Javan, and African rhinoceros horns passed into Ming China. Cups fashioned from this imported material were most likely manufactured in workshops in the Haicheng area, where they were produced alongside and appear to have influenced the design of these De Hua white porcelain vessels, or Blanc de Chine. So the reticulated base, you can see this bit here, appears to have been derived from these ceramic models. But at this period, we can also see De Hua ceramics that start to imitate the shape of the rhinoceros horn. So you see in the bottom, bottom left corner. So these, this kind of back and forth attests to a degree of exchange between craftsmen working in these different materials and these different media in 16th century Fujian. And we know that our protagonist, Wang Daokun, the writer we were looking at, he actually went to Fujian in the 1560s to fight Japanese pirates. So he's probably on that trip that he encountered this cup or acquired his, his version of the cup. At the very least, the flower cup, the appearance of the flower cup, points to this dynamic context of transmedial adaptation and transfer between decorative art practices in 16th century Fujian. As rhinoceros horn cups were shipped into the port complex of Haicheng, horn cups resembling porcelain vessels were also traded overseas, and they start to appear in European collections from the 17th century onwards, from the six, late 16th century onwards. So one such vessel with a ring stand base carved in the form of a five-petal mallow flower, and so almost identical to the cup inscribed by Wang Daokun, was acquired by the tradeskins, John the Elder and John the Younger, and exhibited in their ark in Lambeth in London, which is the earliest Engli English cabinet of curiosities and actually became the first public museum in the country. It also, that collection became the foundation for the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford. Um, so this cup, which is pretty much identical to the cup that Wang Daokun inscribed, um, was included in their 1656 catalog along with what they call a unicorn horn. So it was highly prized by European collectors in the 16th century, just as they were beginning to be praised by notable members of the Chinese scholar elite. These rhinoceros horn flower cups can be seen to exemplify the categorical fluidity of curiosity cabinets for the way they straddle and blur distinctions between conceptions of nature and artifice, between rarity and wonder, as both finely wrought products of human craft and also these fragments of dead animals. So Wang Daokun was inscribing an object that was a product of global trade routes, and it was one that shaped ideas of the exotic at both ends of the Eurasian continent in the 16th century. So if we have seen some of the ways in which Wang's invocation of the cup's floral appearance reflects contemporary trends in vessel design, we can now return to the other part of his, his inscription and the reference to an object named the Sugong. What was this obscure thing? Why does he allude to it in this way? Wang's inscription clearly invokes poems from the ancient canonical anthology, the Book of Songs, which is a sort of foundational text in the Chinese tradition. And many literary inscriptions from Ming China draw from the tetrasyllabic verse forms and the allusions in the Book of Songs. Um, 
and Wang's pledge of his own loyalty to his guest is inflected by the almost erotic undertones of a poem named Mousia from the Book of Songs. So I will now take a beaker of that suhorn, hoping I may not always feel pained. While Wang's inscription imitates the idiom of poems like Mousia, his invocation of the Sugong also gestures to accounts of larger banquet celebrations from the Book of Songs. So, and go to the Hall of Our Prince, there raise the beaker of Suhorn and wish him long life that he may live forever. So you can see Wang's inscription is, is trying to sort of approximate or imitate the rhetoric from the Book of Songs. But what was the Sugong? And what was the point of Wang's allusion in an inscription for a rhinoceros horn cup? Commentators conventionally gloss this object as a drinking vessel made from the horn of a mythic animal named the Su that was in turn commonly defined as an ancient ox uh, with a single horn. The gong made from the horn of the Su or from wooden imitations was categorized by Han Dynasty commentators as a punishment goblet intended for use in archaic drinking games. So the idea is if you lose the drinking game, you have to down alcohol out of one of these really large horns. Uh, given these associations, the Sugong label served as an apt or an appropriate title for a rhinoceros horn cup, hinting at a vessel that was made from the horn of an enigmatic bovine animal, while also invoking the sanction and the prestige of a classical genealogy. There was, however, a complex history of associating the Sugong name with these quirky horn-shaped vessels. So the illustrations to the three classics on ritual a text that did much to set the terms of antiquarian discourse on ritual vessels in late imperial China, conflated the name of the Sugong with an image of what appears to be a writen of Western provenance. So a writen is a vessel usually in the shape of a horn with an animal head on the end. And these types of vessels come from the West. They were imported along the Silk Road. So you can see here, this is a picture from this classical ritual text on um, what the Sugong was supposed to look like. And it imitates the shape of this Western object. Um, so it is likely, as Francois-Louis and others have shown, that editors mistook what were actually luxury cups in a Western or Hellenistic style that had been imported along the Silk Road from the West to be artifacts from high antiquity. So here again, you can see an image of what's supposed to be a sugong, and it's, it, it looks like it's probably based on these Western writen that were found in Central Asia. Um, so the editors essentially thought that these exotic horn-shaped cups from the West were actually ancient vessels described in ritual texts. On the one hand, such misattributions placed exotic things within a classical lineage. And on the other hand, the visual representation of these horn cups and their strange appearances started to undermine the stability of the Sugong as the title of a classical vessel, raising concerns as to what it was actually, what material it was actually made from, what it looked like, and whether or not it was intended for ritual performances. So we see a new level of sort of profound confusion between these exotic designs, these exotic images, and this archaic name. Such tensions would be exacerbated in the Ming and the Qing dynasties with the popular use of the Sugong label for new rhinoceros horn cups, a trend that largely follows Wang Daokun's inscription. This became a fashion that would increasingly frustrate classicists and antiquarians from the period, so in the late Ming, for instance, the commentator Zhang Sujong stressed that the Su is not what is called a rhinoceros and emphasized that the Sugong was only made from the horn of this mythical animal named the Su. By the mid Qing, however, commentators went further by noting that while nowadays people call these horn vessels rhinoceros horn cups, even if a Sugong could be made from wood, it was definitely not made from rhinoceros horn. So these kind of arcane, quite dry commentarial texts are essentially trying to halt the inaccurate use of the Sugong in referring to rhinoceros horn cups. They see this as a trend, they see this contemporary trend as a threat to the proper study of ancient ritual. This might seem kind of a dry and fusty topic to us, but for these classicists, it was a really sort of critical issue. So we can see then how Wang's inscription it succeeds in mixing different materials and designs into new configurations. His inscribed cup is a hybrid artifact, on the one hand alluding to these ceramic models while seeking a lineage among archaic vessels. Wang's rhetoric, his allusions, try to endow what is a distinctly 16th century object with a classical genealogy, yet he ends up unsettling standards in classical scholarship. 
So in trying to make the strange or the exotic seem ancient, Wang ends up making the ancient appear newly strange. Okay, so my, my second case concerns an inscription for a musical instrument named the pipa, a four-stringed lute. The actual marked instrument no longer survives, unlike the rhinoceros horn cup. Yet we can begin to reconstruct its significance for Wang Daokun by turning to its inscription and accompanying literary compositions. So in a sense, the survival of this inscription tells us something about the function of literary inscription in general, in that even if the actual thing disappears, the name will still be transmitted. So just as Wang Daokun wrote one of the first surviving literary inscriptions for a rhinoceros horn cup, he also authored one of the first surviving inscriptions for a pipa. So a musical instrument is a special class of thing for the way it can assume a dual identity, possessing both the visual form of an object, an art object, and the function of a sound producing device, straddling the boundary between exhibition and performance. Wang Daokun makes this point succinctly in his inscription by matching his praise for the material of the pipa. So he begins by saying, what fine wood? Um, and then he matches this with a praise for the music it makes when played. What a fine melody. He opens the opening line of the inscription, um, what fine wood, a raccoon dog's mottled head, uh, is an allusion to words sung by Yuanrang, an acquaintance of Confucius as he touched the hard shell of his mother's coffin. So Yuanrang climbed up on the wood and said, it is a long time since I sang to anything. And so he sings to the wood. It, it is marked like a raccoon dog's head, smooth as a young lady's hand, which you can hold. So the, the markings of the raccoon dog's head later became a metaphor for the finely grained patterning of a wooden surface. Wandalkun then turns to the music of the pipa by invoking the romantic associations of the instrument with the Central Asian frontier. The Han princess, Liu Xijun, was sent to be married to the Khan of the, of the Wusun around 108 BCE and was supposedly accompanied by musicians who played the pipa to soothe her in her grief. This tale came to personify the intimate relationship between, between the dejected figure of a princess given away to a foreign ruler and the, the, the instrument of the pipa in later literary representations. In the poetic imagination, references to playing the pipa on the way to Wusun became signifiers for music suffused with a sense of sorrowful longing and Wang's romantic allusions here invest the musicians playing with similarly exotic and melancholic connotations. He also implicitly opens up the problem of gender in the inscription. While men had long studied the pipa, the instrument retained, unlike the masculine form of the zither, a strong symbolic connection to courtesan performance and to feminine musical expression. So Wang's text is one of the earliest documented attempts to inscribe a pipa, and it could be read as an effort to transform the instrument into an object of masculine identification. Wang's inscription, however, was not for any pipa, but for an instrument associated with a famous musician from his hometown named Jia Ba Shi. Wang and Jia came from Huizhou Prefecture, an area famous in the late Ming for its wealthy merchant families. Despite the rising influence of these merchant lineages, many of whom drew their wealth from the salt trade, Merchants were still denigrated as the lowest of the four social classes in Confucian political theory, behind scholars, farmers, and artisans. So merchants are at the bottom. Uh, there are numerous poems dedicated to Jia from Ming scholars and patrons, yet Wang Daokun goes one step further in endorsing his signature instrument through inscription, and also by composing an accompanying biography of the musician. And we can read such efforts as shaped by Wang's own desire to justify and celebrate these Huizhou merchants as cultural producers. So this is not just about Jia Ba Shi, but it's about Wang himself. So Wang's biography of Jia is, is pretty strange and it sort of moves between documentary, sort of a, kind of a factual register and uh, tropes from fiction essentially. So it begins with the uncanny event of Jia's birth, claiming that his mother dreamt of a divine turtle that entered her bedroom and delivered a son. Jia's birth 
um, his birthday propitiously coincided with his grandfather's 80th birthday, which led to the boy being given the name 80. So he has this very, very auspicious birth. Not only is it kind of magical, but he also, um, his name reflects the kind of sense of good fortune that he carries with him throughout his life. Jia's father and grandfather were both merchants, and he initially follows them into the family business. Much of the rest of the biography is taken up with Wang's attempts to distinguish Jia from courtesan performers. So his formative experience in attempting to master the pipa occurs when he visits a courtesan house in Changzhou, where a woman treats him dismissively because he is a merchant. So he visits this courtesan, and she sort of says, go away, you're just a lowly merchant. And he, gets, he, he becomes furious at this and spills wine over the floor and promises that one day he will become sort of the leading pipa player. He'll sort of outdo the courtesan and then he'll come back and prove it to her. And so later, throughout the rest of the biography, he studies with and eventually surpasses his teachers in learning the pipa. And then he returns to the same courtesan house and leaves the woman awestruck, not daring to face him through her tears and prostrations. So again, Wang is really fixated on this competition between the male pipa performer and the kind of the courtesan performers. It's really saying, you know, this guy is, is, is doing something that courtesan performers can't do. To underscore his broad talents as a male performer, Wang writes of how this musician uh, studied, he also studied with leading figures in martial arts, in horse riding, in archery, in football. He learned how to play the flute and he also learned how to play the zither. So he, the pipa becomes one in this list of activities that raises it and puts it among more suitably masculine pursuits. At recurring intervals, Wang also attempts to absolve Jia of the perceived stigma of his merchant past. So throughout the biography, it sort of says, you know, Jia was offered a lot of money to teach someone to play the pipa, but he refused. He was given a lot of money to develop some project, but he refuses. So Wang is really sort of keen to try and get rid of the stigma of being a merchant. And as in the inscription, Jia's masculinity is both promoted but also kind of undermined in the biography. <clears throat> so Wang is constantly sort of saying how Jia has this kind of male talent that is, you know, allows him to surpass courtesan performers, but yet he never takes a wife and he also refuses to have children. We learn that he has an extended private affair with one of the royal concubines, um, and she offers to leave the, the prince and marry him, but he refuses. So there's this kind of strange tension between his, the kind of espousal of his masculinity and its kind of unraveling. Wang Daokun concludes the biography <coughs> by once more reflecting on the ambivalent social status of the pipa, of the instrument. So at the end of the biography, he says, the unofficial historian says, there is a common saying that the pipa is music of the barbarians, Yet the ancestral clans relished the barnyard millet and cockspur and found worthiness in gambling with board games. And there is a reason to this. In ancient times, Gao Jianli changed his clothes to enter the service of the Qin state and startled his audience with the quality of his playing. So Gao Jianli is an assassin zither player from the ancient classics who tries to, to take out um, the ruler of Qin. Watching Jia Bashi before the old courtesan, Wang asks, what difference is there? And then he concludes, my hometown, he's talking about Huizhou, has a number of these steadfast gallants, these kind of good sort of martial heroes. How, how can we think of you know, Jia Bashi as being one of them? He's one of them. So Wang effectively justifies Jia's career as a performer and his use of the pipa as if he were a mercenary like the famous assassin zither player. Um, and he's, here he's really sort of trying to justify and legitimate the pipa as this symbol of kind of masculine art. And during the same period in which he wrote this biography, Wang was himself working on a collection of four dramas. Um, so he was also a playwright and he was interested in musical drama. And there are a few records now of how Wang composed his lyrics or whether he collaborated with other musicians and actors in, in staging his scripts. Yeah, we can kind of infer behind his praise of the pipa and his kind of fascination with the pipa, um, an incipient concern with defending his own engagements in the culture of musical entertainment. So against this backdrop, the fluid identity of the pipa, the way it, tr it traverses these boundaries between spaces usually segregated along lines of class and gender, 
becomes intertwined with the way a man from a merchant background, whether Jabashi or Wang Daokun himself, might renegotiate established social codes in 16th century China. So I'm sort of saying he's using the kind of the fluidity of the pipa as the symbol to think about his own kind of identity. Wang's inscription ends with a celebration of the lingering music or the pleasure that he derives from listening to Jia's performance. And we actually have a surviving letter addressed from Wang to Jia that requests for the musician to play at his residence. Um, and this is a really sort of rare document from this period. There are very, very few cases of leading scholars or sort of respected scholars writing directly to a musician to invite them to perform. And the letter is, is kind of, again, it's sort of couched in this arcane rhetoric. Um, and there's a lot of contextual information that we no longer have. But it offers, it offers us this fleeting glimpse of how Jabasha's subservience to Wang Daokun's writing was, count, was kind of counteracted or was offset by Wang's own attachments to Jabasha's music. So Wang's terse letter evokes a sense of the elusive memories and the desires that lay behind his investment in Jia's use of the musical instrument. So it suggests to us an intangible excess of longing that inspires yet still ultimately resists inscription. So with the, the two previous examples, we have seen how inscriptions have been adapted for new types of artifacts. In the process, reconfiguring the relations between new and old, between self and other. In this final example, I turn to an inscription not for a single artifact, but for a brand name, a trademark intended for a commercial line of ink cakes. Unlike the rhinoceros horn cup or the pipa, these objects were serially produced and they were intended to be consumed or used up. Um, rather than preserved. So as such, the purpose of the inscription is no longer to serve as a signature memorial to one prestigious artifact, but it, it's intended to be reproduced and to proliferate as a copy. Ink tablets molded from soot and glue sustained the culture of writing in pre-modern China. And so the ink business became a highly lucrative venture, a field of contest between rival entrepreneurs in the late imperial period. Ink makers became effectively cultural celebrities. This might seem kind of strange to us now, but at the time, the, these ink makers were sort of really, really famous celebrities. Um, some of them met with Jesuit missionaries, uh, while others were slandered for their competitiveness and were framed for murdering their rivals. Um, and we have these kind of salacious rumors and gossip from the period about how certain ink makers would lure young boys back to a snake pit in their garden to throw the boys in so the snake could eat it, and then they would kill the snake to make glue for ink. So you get this really sort of um, strange kind of <coughs> celebrity culture around these ink makers. Um, and the craft of ink making was transformed during the late 16th century as ink makers took advantage of these larger commercial markets and new advances in technologies of production for glue and molding to expand both the scale of their manufacturing businesses and also the range of their products. At the same time, with the influence of a booming print industry, ink makers and their patrons began to produce lavish illustrated catalogues displaying images of their designs. Um, and then they would solicit endorsements from leading poets or leading writers to sort of advertise their designs. So here on the left, you can see one of these images from a woodblock catalog, and then how that image is also printed or stamped onto an actual ink cake. Um, and many of these designs, like this design here, is based on a very famous painting of an elephant from the seventh century. So that it's adapting this sort of canonical painting source and putting it on this kind of commercial ink cake that can be sold and then used up. Um, and many of these designs sort of incorporated these other, other visual sources from decorative art objects. So in a sense, it, it leads to the same kind of mixing between different types of craft that we saw with the rhinoceros horn cup at the beginning. To Wang Daokun, our author, the, the sort of the figure we've been looking at throughout this talk, he was really critical to these developments. So he assisted a local ink maker named Fang Yulu with the publication of an illustrated catalog, one of the first of these illustrated catalogs. And he also composed literary endorsements for this ink maker's products. Now this ink maker, Fang Yulu, 
was from Huizhou region, so the same region as the pipa player as well. And like the pipa player, he was also from a merchant family. Um, and then this is an example drawn from his catalogue. And this is one of his ink cakes that survives in the Palace Museum in Beijing. So ink cakes <coughs> were conventionally marketed under an ink maker's name or his studio name. So these are sort of short trademarks that would typically be stamped onto the sides of the ink cake, telling you who made it or the, the name of the, the workshop that made it. So this is a surviving ink cake from the Ming Dynasty, and you can see on one side is the ink maker's sort of signature, you know, Fang Yulu made this, and on the right-hand side is the name of his studio or the name of his workshop. Um, but during the late 16th century, due to a heightened degree of competition and rivalry between different manufacturers, artisans had to develop more specialized distinctions to advertise the novelty of a particular line of products. So if you're an ink maker and you bring out one ink cake with your name on it, that's all well and good, but then your rivals bring out new products and you have to sort of come back with a newer, better version of your own ink. Um, and to do so, you have to develop these kind of more specialized distinctions or these new kind of al alluring uh, brand names to advertise your products. So to do this, they devised what are called ink grade titles or brand names for different recipes of ink. So Fang Yulu's name when he was the, the ink maker we're looking at, um, he had five of these titles. Um, the first was called Jasper Reed and then when that sort of fell out of popularity he brought in a new one called Fragrance of the Great Kingdom and then when that was uh, sort of seen as passe he developed Great Purple Double Mystery, non -sut, and then Nine Mysteries and Three Absolutes. So these very sort of arcane, obscure names were actually brands that he brought out to try and advertise his newest, latest line of ink. And you can see these are images of some of the ways in which these, these brands were actually stamped onto the sides of ink cakes. Okay, so these names were meant to mark tangible qualities tangible sort of differences in the quality of the ink. So they're, they're supposed to sort of refer to different recipes, but obviously there's only so many types of variation you can have with ink. Um, so they gradually shed these specific associations to acquire a kind of phantasmatic life in their own as brand names. The ink grade title became first and foremost a semiotic assemblage, a connotationally rich and referentially poor proper name structured to evoke a world of beauty, harmony, energy, desire, clarity, so many of these titles combine Taoist allusions to the cosmic or the sublime with an evocation of the sensory qualities of black ink. So it's luster, it's fragrance, or it's tonality. So a key term that comes up in a lot of these brand names is this character Xuan, which means both mystery or profundity or uh, the abstruseness, but it also literally means black. Okay, so it's kind of a pun. It suggests this kind of Taoist metaphysical virtue of obscurity, but it's also just a description of the black quality of ink. Um, and as such, it became a pretty widely used pun or metaphor for branding ink. Um, and this, this, this character, Xuan, essentially functions as a pun, compressing a direct treatment of the product with a much broader evocation of symbolic worth. We can think of this in a similar way to how contemporary advertising slogans might talk about like golden potato chips. So on the one hand, golden describes like a crisp substance, but it also evokes monetary worth <coughs> or great levels of wealth. So there's the same kind of compression of a direct kind of literal description of the product and this evocation of symbolic value. Um, so in coming up with a brand name for ink, a manufacturer needed a name that had these kind of mystical or metaphysical associations while also saying something quite literal about the product. Ink grade titles, these brand names, were also generated and publicized through the manipulation of poetic tropes. So the brand name Non Sut, which became one of sort of the most popular brand names at this time, actually refers to an auspicious vapor named Non Mist, which is described in the records of the Grand Historian. And this motif was often used in poetry as an auspicious omen, um, but the ink maker kind of redefines the associations of this poetic trope with the substance of ink through a pun on the character yen as soot. So he takes this word non-mist and turns it into non-soot to talk about ink. So the title non-soot appears twice made. It's a figure gleaned from the images and shadows of earlier poems, preserved only so long as it is necessary to see that they have been canceled. <coughs> 
And to publicize Fang Yulu's non-cert brand name, Wang Daokun composed a short inscription that rewrites the passage from the Astronomer's Treatise in which non-mist first appeared. So this text, this is the final inscription we're looking at, is essentially a jingle. It's like an advertising jingle that just repeats the brand name over and over. Um, so Wang's inscription ends up not really as a celebration of auspicious vapors or of any properties of ink, but of the pun of non-cert itself. And with Wang Daokun's endorsement, non-cert would go on to become Fang Yulu's most widely recognized and one of the most well-publicized brand names in the 1580s. And it was included as a visual advertisement within the catalog, so you can see on the right. And it was also stamped onto ink cakes. So here's an example, kind of a blurry example of the brand actually stamped onto an ink cake. Shortly after its emergence onto the market, however, this brand name was subject to a series of consumer complaints. To cite one of several examples, a renowned calligrapher claims that Fang just packed his ink with musk to make it smell nice, but the quality was actually like cheap paste. So he's saying, it's just, you're a fraud. You're essentially just making this thing smell like perfume, but it, it's actually just, you know, when you grind it or try to use it for calligraphy, it's rubbish. Um, it's striking, actually, that the focus of these attacks, and there are, there are quite a few of them. I can only really want to deal with this one today. Um, the focus of the criticism is not really the ink maker himself, but it's Wang Daokun, the author of the inscription. So it's Wang as the author of the brand name, or the, the guy who promotes the brand name through literature, who becomes sort of held responsible for misleading or for duping customers. Uh, so throughout this talk, I've looked at cases where the human author strives to shape the reception of a marked object. But here we witness kind of an inversion of this dynamic where the fate of the object changes the reputation of the human writer. And this tells us something about the strange power of a brand name in Ming China, the way in which the fame of a brand name shaped expectations of a product. So it raises the question of who, who was really the author of the brand name? Was it the, the manufacturer who made the ink, who made the commodity, or was it the poet who wrote the inscription? And then sort of even stranger is despite these negative reviews, Rival ink makers still try to steal the non-cert label and publicize it as their own product. So Fang Yulu's bitter rival, Cheng Junfang, a figure he even tried to frame for murder, laid claim to the non-cert label by composing his own inscription for the brand. So even as this brand name was sort of widely slated, um, other manufacturers sort of took it up as their own and tried to claim that it was their own. And we also see evidence from the Qing dynasty of various ink sticks attributed to other ink makers bearing the non-cert label. So even if Wang Daokun suffered from these negative reviews, the actual brand name itself took on a life of its own, shedding any kind of clear ties to a particular author or to a particular manufacturer. And we can see related examples with other ink brands from the late Ming. After Wang's endorsement of non-cert, it became very common for rival manufacturers to try to lay claim to the same brand name, trying to outdo each other in making a better version of the commodity. Rather than devise a new brand name for a new product, they tried to make new products that might live up to the promise and desirability of the brand name. And we can see this, for instance, with this later brand name. This is another example of this kind of branding called Black Unicorn Marrow. Um, and with this brand, it's really unclear like, who actually released it, because we see like, a proliferation of different ink makers saying, this is my brand, no, this is my brand. Um, and here, these are two surviving examples where these rival ink makers are both trying to lay claim to the same brand name. And in these cases, the brand name appears to have been the primary source of value for collectors. So collectors, when they collected these objects, they weren't really bothered about the ink maker's name. They were really interested in this, this kind of the brand name. And so we can think of the brand here as effectively the author of the object, rather than the ink maker or the, or the writer of a poetic endorsement. Throughout this talk, I have looked at practices of writing on things that might initially seem kind of far removed from our own world, strategies that locate ethical significance in the act of inscription. Yet perhaps we can end here with the emergence of these sophisticated forms of commercial branding. With these cases, we see strategies for labeling artifacts with writing that prefigure or in some sense resonate with aspects of our own material culture. 
where we remain fascinated with, occasionally manipulated by, and sometimes overwhelmed with the, sh with the sheer number of alluring words stamped onto objects. Thank you. I mean, the only ink cakes we have from the period are ink cakes that were preserved. Preserved, oh, right. right. Um, and ink was a very common sort of birthday present, and it was also very common as a gift you would give someone when they passed exam. It's still in China today. You know, people will buy someone an ink stone or an ink cake when they do well in the in college examinations. So at the same time, in this period, they were they were very common in cultures of gift giving, gift exchange as well. Yeah. Yeah. So then you get to the ink cake thing. I was also thinking how if you have people who say that's just scraps of paper with writing on it, mm -hmm. was there anything in that book that was also on these objects that had writing on it? Did people feel that they should not be out? Well, then it's not the example of an ink stone, it's like a wooden spoon. Mm -hmm. But is there any overlap between the preciousness of the paper with writing on it and the preciousness of objects with writing on it? Um. There, yes, I think, I think, I mean, there was a culture of collecting, there's a culture of sort of collecting refined stationery from this period. So you would collect sets of paper alongside sets of ink cakes or an ink stone or a nice brush alongside paper or ink. But kind of what I wanted to show in the talk was how, even though we, we think of inscriptions as associated with permanence or as associated with preserving a kind of attachment to a single object, a singular kind of precious object, during this period, the uses of inscriptions suddenly sort of are opened up and they, it's adapted for these kind of new, um, these new strategies, commercial branding, trademarking, advertising. Um, and there, the idea of permanence is, is less important. And really what's, what matters is the kind of the proliferation of this thing as a copy. So when you, when you come up with one of these brand names, you don't want it to just be on one sort of surviving, rare, precious, heirloom that's passed down through your family, you want it to be copied and to be. Is the verb Ming still used with the ink stones? Um, so today I was looking, I mean, there's lots of other types of markings that are written onto objects. I was looking at the specific literary genre, this kind of short, um, usually rhyming uh, sort of admonition or um, moral instruction. So yeah, there's, there's the, the examples I was looking at today are within this kind of narrow genre. But there are, there are all other types of poetry, other types of prose that were also carved onto things. Um, but I wanted to show how this kind of genre was adapted or reused in this period um, for these kind of new purposes. Uh, when I was listening to you, uh, you talking about this intense um, the collector's avarice for various kinds of ink stones and brands mm -hmm. rather than being concerned if they were genuine or not. I just couldn't help thinking of this obsession with red wine yeah, in collector circles. Yeah. And there, there are two, like this red obsession yeah. and there's also sour grapes about yeah. some famous fraud. Yeah. I mean, do you think this is just like free association on my part? Or no, no, no. no, I mean, it struck you it's, it's very interesting if you read kind of ethnographic accounts of like contemporary wine the wine business and wine connoisseurship, it's very similar, the kind of language and the, the kind of competitions for distinction that you see with wine connoisseurship is very similar to the stuff you see with ink and tea as well in, in Imperial China. Because these were products that you know, were, were supposed to be used up, but then you do get collectors who hoard them or try and keep, keep one back. So you would, have, you would have a lot of calligraphers who would buy two ink cakes, one that they would use and one that they would sort of put away in the cupboard um, as a collectible. Um, and you have vintage ink. So in the, in the 16th century, you have a lot of collectors who, who you know, claim that they owned like a 10th century ink cake that they hadn't used, and it actually smelt better in the 16th century than it would have done in the 10th century. So yeah, this is the, the language and the kind of the practice is really similar to, to wine connoisseurship. <laughs> 
Uh, thank you for this uh, for this talk. I wanted to go back to uh, to sort of the broader framing of these inscriptions as a place for writing and uh -huh. as a genre. It seems to me, based on these examples, that that irony is really the the primary figure. Yeah. Right. So it's the tension between um, the object and writing, uh -huh. but also between the regimes of value associated with them. Right. So that. Um, I mean, it seems that to me the interesting thing is that the irony comes from this discrepancy between the thing and the writing, uh, but also between these regimes of value of a dominant ideology in which one is not supposed to covet these objects, right? And so these objects provide a, an alternative space of writing to legitimize these objects and mm -hmm. to legitimize owning these objects and desiring these objects, and yet at the same time the writing inscribes them within mm -hmm. that dominant ideology. Yep. Um, as I think, I think that is a, an interesting um, operation. Mm -hmm. right? and, it, and I think what you said about the, the salt merchants and their ambivalent status matches this really well, mm -hmm. right? that there is basically these, these but are in effect two legitimate regimes of value, mm -hmm. right? In which merchants actually have a very high status; they're not at the bottom, yeah. right? And they actually have greater access to scholarship, and these are objects that scholars need, mm -hmm. and by which they profile themselves, and by which they realize their social value. And yet, there's still this discrepancy with uh, this rhetorical regime of mm -hmm. the dominant ideology. Yeah, and I, I think I mean the examples I tried to bring today are examples where the sort of the prestige of the object isn't clear. So these are all cases at this time where, um, you know, he's really, th this writer is really one of the first to inscribe that type of object. And you have people inscribing inkstones, different types of sort of more kind of masculine objects like the zither that go back hundreds and hundreds of years. And they're very sort of, you know, there are very clear kind of rhetorical conventions. But with rhinoceros horn cups, which are, you know, coming into China at this time and uh, are seen as these kind of exotic foreign goods or the pipa, which is seen as this kind of feminine, um, it's associated with feminine performers, with feminine musicians. Here, it's not clear like how you, for me, th these are interesting cases because it's not clear how you legitimate the object or how you, you know, justify the value or the prestige of the object. The inscription is trying to do that but it isn't, you know, there isn't a sort of a set model or a set sort of um, selection of sources that you can use to do that. So it's this really interesting moment where he's trying to use words to justify or to um, assert the value of these new objects, but the objects themselves kind of resist um, older or sort of more established forms of valuation. So yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I have a, a technical question and then a more interesting one. Um, so the technical question is related to um, what David was asking about, which is, um, is there a different method? Are these characters incised on the ink cakes or are they stamped sometimes using ink oh yeah, no. onto the ink cakes? They're stamped. They're, They're molded. Stamped. They're part of the mold. They're part of the mold. Yeah, so when you make an ink cake, you have, uh, ink is basically a mixture of lamp black and glue, and then you put it in a wooden mold. So in uh, addition to having a product that is going to have the same inscription as others, that inscription is made in using a, different a way. stamp. Yeah. Um, so that it not only is a copy for each individual user, but it's easy to reproduce yeah. in a way that the other two examples were not because they are carved. Uh, well, we, I mean, we don't actually know if the pipa was ever actually right. carved, but yeah, the, uh, the idea is that it's It would have been. Yeah. So there we have a sort of different process mm -hmm. of, of, of making inscriptions. Um, okay, so that's interesting. Um, but the, the question that I, I was really interested about is you seem to jump um, pretty quickly from uh, looking at sort of the, the details of the object, thinking about surface, thinking about material, in the case of the uh, rhinoceros horn cup, 
thinking about how it's drawing from uh, or, or in communication with other sort of artisan uh, traditions. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, you didn't talk too much today about the actual aesthetic quality of the character's presence on these objects. Mm -hmm. um, so you mentioned, for example, that the characters are positioned on the lip of the cup and how that would affect our reading. But I was interested, especially when we started to talk about global circulation, mm -hmm. um, obviously the effect of characters, if there were characters on that rhino um, horn that cup, would change in Europe sure. because they would be illegible. But I'm wondering about the practice in the late Ming of sort of making up characters or making characters particularly dif difficult to read by mm -hmm. using ancient scripts um, and then going into the Qing, whether we see sort of inscriptions in languages, um, Manchu, um, mm -hmm. um, or otherwise that were, were sort of used more ma maybe for their aesthetic function because many people wouldn't be able to read them or sort mm -hmm. of how, um, so illegibility on the one hand, but also the aesthetic function of, of these words yeah. on objects change over time. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's a, a very you know, huge topic. Um, during the 16th century, you do see lots of, uh, especially in ceramics, you see the adaptation of Sanskrit script, Tibetan, you see the adaptation of different forms of Arabic calligraphy as kind of part of a decorative program on the object. And obviously calligraphy is an important part of this culture of inscription. Um, the authors themselves pr never sort of carved the actual inscription. They would sort of write it with a brush and then a an artisan would carve over the brush work. Um, I think probably my, my kind of point is, you know, a lot of these things have been left to art historians and to scholars of art history um, who are precisely interested in the kind of questions you're thinking about, you know, how does this work within the visual program of the object? How does the calligraphy interact with other features of the design of the object? And as a literary scholar, I kind of wanted to show that these texts perform a kind of, um, you know, a kind of sophisticated literary work. They're not just decoration, although there's nothing wrong with it just being decoration. And they are obviously playing a part in the kind of decorative program of the object. But I wanted to suggest ways in which these, these kind of small, seemingly insignificant texts that are almost all made up of illusions, actually they do kind of interesting things with literary writing, through punning, through illusion, through you know, the creation of these new metaphors, through creation of new sort of sets of equivalences. Um, and as a literary scholar, that's what I find kind of interesting about these things, is the same as sort of Christian's question about how these these strategies of writing are trying to make sense of these new objects. How are they trying to, um, you know, celebrate these new objects when there isn't a kind of set vocabulary there? So in this talk, I was trying to sort of show that kind of literary dimension to these things. But as you know, this this example is a is a inkstone in the Palace Museum with a Susha inscription on it, um, and it you know it's probably not written by Susha, but it's adapted from calligraphy that's supposed to imitate Susha. So here, the calligraphy is obviously an incredibly important part of what made this object a desirable artifact for collectors. You know, the idea that it has traces of brushwork that looks like um, this sort of, you know, one of the most famous calligraphers in the Chinese tradition. But yeah, there, th there is this kind of interest in illegibility with some of the ink cake designs as well. They, you know, they adapt strange characters from um, these kind of made up inscriptions or um, Central Asian scripts. So there is, the, the in the 16th century, yeah. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of interesting play with calligraphic sources in the ink, in the design of these ink cakes. Um, I was looking, you know, I offered only one kind of example of this, um, of the adaptation of painting. But I mean, even here you can see the adaptation of the script, th this kind of variant form of seal script mm -hmm. is playing on the kind of the, the strangeness of, the, the, of this kind of archaic script. Um, and you see this as really common in other designs. Um, yeah, so there's a lot of recycling. 
because of the time, uh, but I want to thank you very much for talking thank about you. your research. Thank you.